the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's go now to chapter 7. Let's find out what happens to Stephen. Stephen's going to give, he's going to give a long speech in this trial. It's very, it's actually a very complex speech that Stephen gives. Um, and it's actually, you kind of have to read it a couple times to get his message. What he's going to do is he's going to say, first he's going to talk about Abraham. Then he's going to talk about Joseph. And then he's going to talk about Moses. Now, this is really interesting. Why would Stephen go to Joseph and, you know, spend a good portion of his speech on Joseph, you know, of all people? Number one, he's, he's using figures that are in the Torah, in the law, in the Pentateuch. What's that? That's the first five books of the Bible, right? You know those books, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And, and so he's going, he's going to the Torah, especially the book of Genesis. But what's also important is Joseph was like Jesus. If you remember the story of Joseph, he was rejected by his own brethren. He was sold for silver. He was hated because he recounted prophecy to his brothers. He was falsely, you know, he was, he, he was thought to be dead. And then his own brothers came to him begging for mercy. Remember that story? In about 15 different ways, if you read the story very closely, you go, wow, this is just like Christ, okay? Of course, the promises made to Abraham, they're fulfilled in Christ. And so, and then Moses, through Moses came the law, but Moses promised that a prophet like him would come, whom all must listen to. So as you read this long speech by Stephen, Look closely at the figures he chooses to talk about. There's a reason behind each person. Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. Okay, so let's go to chapter 7. Let's take a look. And in chapter 7 it says, The high priest said to him, said, Is this so? And Stephen said, Brethren and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Depart from your own land and from your own kindred, and go into the land which I will show you. Then he departed from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him in possession and to his posterity after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect that his posterity would be aliens in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and ill-treat them for 400 years. But I will judge the nation which they serve, said the, said the Lord, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Now you're probably reading this and thinking, well, this is all good. I can, it's probably the high priest is probably nodding his head for the most part. There is kind of a little nuance in there. Notice the section where Stephen says, Abraham received no inheritance. Very important point, because ultimately, our inheritance is an eternal inheritance in Christ, okay? Uh, but so far, it sounds pretty good, right? Sounds good? Okay. So watch the rhetoric here, all right? Verse 9, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him in Egypt. Notice how we just kind of... Boom, we just went to Joseph right here. The patriarchs, okay, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. So God took a, he, he said that your descendants are going to be slaves in Egypt. I'm going to take you out of Egypt. And the patriarchs are even selling their own brother to go be a slave in Egypt. It's almost like the whole exodus is prefigured. But God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt who made him governor over Egypt and over all his household. Now there came a famine throughout all of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent forth our fathers the first time. 
And at that second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Do you remember that? When Joseph made himself known to his brothers in the book of Genesis? Do you remember what the key moment was in the book of Genesis? Genesis chapter 44 and 45. Just a side note, a footnote in the conversation. What was the key moment that Joseph saw that his brothers wanted to change? One of them named Judah wanted to give his life for his brother Benjamin. And that was right there. The light went on. Joseph could see that his brothers had changed. But let's continue here. Okay, so here we are back in verse uh, 13. And at that second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and called to him Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 70 souls. And Jacob went down into Egypt. Notice you go down into Egypt, you go up to Jerusalem. You guys are catching this, right? Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died himself and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt till there arose over Egypt another king who had not known Joseph. He dealt craftily with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants that they might not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born and was beautiful before God. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. Now notice this is a beautiful summary so far of the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus right here. You've got a beautiful summary, okay? But, so let's see where Stephen's going here. Verse 23, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel, and seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking the Egyptian. He supposed that his brethren understood that God was giving them deliverance by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and would have reconciled them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, after 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to look, the voice of the Lord came. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did, did not dare look. And the Lord said to him, take off the shoes from your feet. For the place where you, where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the ill treatment of my people that are in Egypt and heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made you ruler and judge? God sent as both ruler, and deliverer by the hand of the angel that appeared to him in the bush. Are you starting to see where Stephen's going with this argument here? I mean, it's taken him a little while to get there. And you have to really appreciate this. You know, in the ancient world, they valued rhetoric. We don't, we don't value rhetoric. We, we just want to go right to the point. We're very direct, right? But in the ancient world, there was a real value for rhetoric. He's going through the history of Israel. He's pointing at the Abrahamic promise. He's pointing at how jo Joseph was rejected by his own brothers. 
He's pointing at how Moses was rejected by his own people, the one that they claimed, who made you ruler and judge? God made him ruler and judge, and he delivered them from Egypt. And Stephen's point, you can kind of see where he's going. If you guys did, you know, if Abraham never really received the fullness of this promise, if Joseph was rejected by our own fathers, the patriarchs, Moses was rejected by his own people who said, who made you ruler and judge? What have you done with Jesus? Do you see where this is going? You can kind of see where this is starting to go right here, okay? So there's, it's a long chapter, but you can see the reason for this, okay? And so here we are. We're in verse 36. Let's go to 35. This Moses whom they refused, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? God sent as both a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel that appeared to him in the bush. He led them out having performed wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet from your brethren as he raised me up. Now there's the clinch verse right there. It's a very important promise. It's in De Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. Right as Moses is finishing his ministry, he's telling them, God is going to send you another Moses, but even better. Another Moses, but even better. And him you must listen to. Now, what's the difference between Moses and all the other prophets in the Bible? There's one big difference. One big difference. Moses is the mediator of the Sinai covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new and eternal covenant. And when you come to Mass at the celebration of the Eucharist, when you hear those words, that this is the blood of the new and eternal covenant, right there, you should, you should go, oh my gosh, that's in fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 to 19. Jesus is the mediator of the new and eternal covenant. And he's establishing, essentially, the Eucharist while he celebrates the Passover. He's giving us the new hidden manna, as the book of Revelation says in chapter 2, verse 17. And so here's, verse 38's important, because it says, I'm sorry, verse 37, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet from your brethren as he raised up me. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel, who spoke to him at Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, and he received living oracles to give us. Our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside in their hearts as they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods to go before us. For as this, Mo for as this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their hands. But God turned and gave them over to worship the host of heavens, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Do you offer to me slain beasts and sacrifices? Forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel, and you took up the tent of Molech and the star god, the god Rephan, the figures which you made to worship. I will remove you from beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, even as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern. Okay, so let's talk about that. So very interestingly, Stephen kind of gives a whole summation of what happened after they got out of Egypt. They rebelled against Moses. They worshiped the golden calf at Sinai. And then when they came into the promised land, they continued to worship false gods. Molech was a god that they even sacrificed children to. And so they did the most heinous crimes of what you call apostasy. Apostasy is when one falls away from the faith, even when they were in the promised land. And so after telling him that, he goes back to the tabernacle. Why does he go back to the tabernacle? Because because God literally dwelt in the presence of his people. And he quotes a very famous verse. It's in Exodus 25, verses 7 through 8, where the Lord says to Moses, make everything according to the pattern. And you're probably sitting here going, pattern? What are you talking about? Pattern. Okay, 
when Moses went up Mount Sinai, he saw the Lord's heavenly tabernacle. And so the pattern talking about, talked about here is Moses is commanded to build the tabernacle according to the pattern of what he saw on Sinai. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Okay. In other words, the, the tabernacle on earth, which, will, which was built in the desert at Sinai, was a model of God's heavenly tabernacle. And so let's see what it says in verse 44. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, even as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it with Joshua when they dispossessed, dispossessed the nations, which God thrust out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked leave to find a habitation for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands, as the prophet says. So now he's going to talk about the tabernacle and the temple. You remember that David wanted to build the temple, but David had shed too much blood, according to, to First and Second Chronicles. And so because of that, his son Solomon was the temple builder. And all of a sudden, Stephen switches and he says, you know what? God was present. He dwelt in our midst, in the tabernacle, in the temple, but he doesn't dwell in houses made out of stone. He wants to dwell in us, his church. So look at how he changes the tune a little bit here. Verse 49. As the prophet says, the heaven is my throne and the earth my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears? You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth against him. But he, full of, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand. Of God. Now, you can see where Stephen has brought this, uh, you know, his uh, speech to. He's basically saying, you know what, our forefathers, you know, they rejected Moses, they rejected Joseph, they had the temple, but they didn't really understand what it was about. They worshiped false gods while they had a, temp a tabernacle and temple in their midst. And he, essentially he's saying, and you've rejected the Messiah. So he's saying, like, you've taken it even one step further. Why are you uncircumcised of heart? The phrase uncircumcised of heart, it's used many times in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is basically saying, you need to have conversion. You need to have conversion if you're going to enter into this land. Okay, and so now what's going to happen? Stephen, this is really amazing. As he finishes, he sees Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And he says, I see the Son of Man. Why does he call Jesus the Son of Man? Do you remember in the Gospels, there were three titles that were used for Jesus, three special titles. Do you remember what those three titles were? Uh, Jesus is called the Messiah or the Christ. That means the anointed one. You guys know that one, right? The, the anointed ministry was a ministry that was exercised by priests, prophets, and kings. You got that. And Jesus is par excellence the full, fullness of all those ministries. But then also, two other titles that are used in the gospel. Jesus is called the Son of God. Do you remember that? At the temptation, the devil threw that one out there. If you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. He continued to use the phrase Son of God. And then finally, Jesus is called the Son of Man. Most people don't know what Son of Man comes from. 
It comes from Daniel chapter 7, verses, verses 10 to 14. Daniel has this vision of one who will rule over all the kingdoms of the earth. And he's one who is like a son of man who comes upon the clouds. In other words, he looks like he's human. And this is Christ. And so the son of man is, is the prophetic figure spoken about in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. I just want to bring that up. And so in verse 57, it said, They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together upon him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man. And what was the young man's name? Saul. Now this is a really interesting scene because the Romans had taken away the right for capital punishment. That's why Jesus' trial is so complicated. But you could see this is just done very quickly by really an angry mob. He's taken out of the, out of the city. The traditional site is right outside of Jerusalem in the Kidron Valley. And there is a man standing there, and it's who? It's Saul. And, and so in verse 59, it says, As they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. It reminds us of Christ. Remember Jesus' last words on the cross? Into your hands I commend my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That also reminds you of Jesus. Of course, those words are found in Luke's gospel where Jesus says, what does he say? Father, forgive them. What do you guys say when you're in a difficult situation and somebody has offended you? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Hopefully you, you say that in a difficult situation, right? But the point that I want to make is, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. It's in Luke's gospel. It's in Luke's gospel. And also, uh, Luke also wrote Acts of the Apostles. And we have the prayer of Stephen, where he says, do not hold this sin against them. So very similar uh, themes, both by Luke. And so if you go on here, it says, the very first verse of chapter 8, it says, when they had said this, he fell asleep. Death is often likened to sleep. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 8, Saul was consenting to his death. Notice how Saul is introduced. He's introduced as one who gives approval to the death of the first martyr. Very significant. Uh, and so there's much that we could say about this speech, but I think it's beautiful to see how Stephen develops the speech. He's trying to say, don't be rebellious like your forefathers. Accept the Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.